Okay. So yeah, welcome uh, both the two in the room and the one, two, three, four, oh, let's see, Flavia, four online. And uh, today, so the grad students have handed in lab one, and as I mentioned, I'll be marking it over the next few days, just so you kind of check out, I guess, my style um, well before you've got to get lab two done. Lab two, I pushed its due date. It's something like the 26th of February. It's like the Monday after, um, I almost said Slack week again. That, that used to be an expression at Western, you know, country club U. Um, but yeah, the Monday after reading week. So um, we're going to start to talk about stuff in lab two today. Uh, which really gets us, it's kind of the meat of the course, at least in terms of univariate stats. So starting with the idea of of linear models, and it's overwhelmingly what, the stuff in lab two is overwhelmingly what you'll use, you know, in your thesis stuff. There'll be some exceptions to that, some fancy modeling that people do, but I think we'll get into um, most of what you'll have to wade through when you're analyzing your own research data and um yeah and and maybe as i said when we started out a slightly different take on things um from what you've had before um sometimes hopefully to provoke you to well two things two ways to provoke you one is in questioning how things are done in your discipline, and then also question how I'm saying things things should be done. So sort of both ways. So we have a constructive conversation that that uh, is good for all of us. All right. So without further ado, so what I'm going to do as usual, and and uh, by the way, welcome. I guess a new member of the group, uh, Mike Dusevic, uh and Mike, I think you're at Carleton doing a PhD or master's with Steve Cook, right? Yeah, that's correct. I'm at uh, Carleton in Steve's lab doing my uh, master's in my second year. So just finishing up. Yeah, and Mike's uh, had a chance to chat with Mike a few weeks ago about um, the, the data that he's confronting in his master's. It's it's really cool stuff. So uh, yeah, welcome. And Mike's not officially one of us. He's here strangely by choice. <laughs> so we'll see if he comes back next week. But um, as I've said to all of you and certainly told Mike, uh, yeah, the, the recordings such as they are and um, thank God for fast forward. I've watched a few of them <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, they're all, they're all there. If you're in the course, they're in Canvas sites, whether it's the grad stats or the directed studies. Now I've got those mirrored. And um, Mike, you you know, uh, with those links I sent you, I just kind of add the link to each week's stuff in that sub page of my website. So, okay, got to get to the slides. So I'll share my screen now that I have taken down all my passwords. And yeah, we'll spend, I don't know, 45 minutes. I'm going to talk about um, linear models. And again, a lot of the stuff will be familiar, um, like super familiar in the case of some of you. And feel free to kind of, you know, order from Amazon or whatever as I do it. And and then it's there. It's just, just certain things I think might help you. And And certainly if I say something that's, like 180 degrees away from the stats that you thought you knew pretty well, then then just stop me and ask about it. No problem. Uh, and then after I catch my breath, we'll uh, we'll actually I'll open up Lab Two and we'll sort of confront the uh, the scripts because I think they'll be I think they'll be pretty useful to you not just to get the lab done but in other contexts. So. And somebody said something in the chat, so I better look at what that was. Welcome. Thank you, Raina. I think that was for Mike. But... Okay. So. 
के प्यार थी I've got my producer here helping me. Um, only one. There, I share that. And just got to change it from the annoying. And it's interesting. So you Zoom people, are you seeing that annoying uh, next slide thing? You know, the PowerPoint thing that you see when you're giving a talk at a conference, or are you just seeing the slide? Uh, last couple of times you presented, I've just seen the slides. Oh, good. Okay. So I'll just keep doing it this way. And not that it really matters, but anyway. Okay. So, um, yeah, I think, I think the best way to think about linear models and this takes in like everything from t test you know you're trying to figure out whether there's a difference or not between two groups in some quantitative variable to like multivariate manova three-way manova or uh, uh, complex multiple regression models or whatever but i always think of it and i apologize for this this is a terrible cartoon i gotta think if somebody can find a better one linear model just send it to me and i'll plug it into the slide um, but anyway i always think about linear models as you're trying to explain things you're building a model and that's yeah um, they can't do it. Okay. i actually share <laughs> like uh, you know i started doing stuff and maybe i didn't no, I didn't actually share the screen. Like, what an idiot. Thank you, Claudia, for stopping me <laughs> for half an hour later. <laughs> um, okay. So, yeah, just thinking about... Um, thinking about... That's okay. Yeah, like when when you build a model, um, I don't know. It, it's it's um, almost it's just semantics, but it, I don't know. For me, it's more helpful than that. So, like, even if you're just comparing two groups or whatever, I, I'm trying to explain the past. I'm I'm sort of thinking about it as how much does knowing sex help me explain body size. Uh, or help me predict body size. If I go out and find those um, Chinook salmon that that uh, Mike Thorne shared the data, with, how much does knowing the sex uh, help me predict what the body size is going to be, or whether or not the fish has a lamprey attached to it, stuff like that? So I I think about it as like building a predictive or explanatory model. And um, there's lots of people, especially if like me, you know, I've spent my life just looking at so-called observational data. You know, that's where you go out and you measure stuff or you like, like Omar, you get a bunch of data that have been collected by people sampling water. But um, so I've spent my, my life doing that as opposed to doing experiments in the lab, you know, growth chambers and different temperatures and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and there's a lot of people, and maybe you got this in intro stats or whatever, that with observational data, you can't really talk about cause. You know, you really need an experiment to talk about cause. And um, that's actually a deeper question than you think. First of all, I argue with my experimental colleagues. I mean, I don't really argue with them, but I say, you know, I, I have this conceptual model, which everybody's done for for lab one and this is what i think is going on in terms of causality i'm not pretending that i'm just looking at correlation and measuring them and, and honestly that used to be my idea oh, i'm gonna just collect the data let the data tell me what's going on you know all that usual stuff but i have this idea of this you know the ph of the lake causes this 
size of egg mass in these amphibians or whatever. And I collect the data and with the hypothesis testing paradigm, I'm gonna test that statistical hypothesis, um, but it's very much, you know, I wanna make a prediction. If the lake is this pH, what am I gonna see in terms of the size of, of egg masses? So this is kind of what I think of as the paradigm. And it's not an equation in the sense, you know, when when you took math and, and or chemistry or something like that, it's not an equation that balances. It's a, on the left side of this paradigmatic general linear model. You've got response of response variable or variables, sometimes called the dependent variable, you know, the sort of lingo. And then on the right side of that, you've got predictors or sometimes called independent variables. Um, so again, just for myself, it kind of helps me think about data that I'm, I'm looking at or analyzing or deciding what to do with data. Because every, everybody here now has this data set, big or small or whatever. How many observations have you got, Omar? It's like uh, well, hundreds, right? Yeah, Omar's got hundreds of E. coli um, observations, concentrations from water samples from different lakes and blah, blah, years and stuff like that. So um, but the, in thinking about his sort of analyses, there's lots of stuff he could do and lots of stuff he'd probably done in, that, in lab one. He thinks about, okay, E. coli, how does this other information help me explain E. coli and therefore potentially help me predict it going forward. So this is kind of a table showing you that even in the relatively simple world of general linear model, um, here's a bunch of, of models that we give different names. And, you know, nothing amuses me more at a master's defense when, you know, some prof <laughs> says, says, oh, you know, um, I'm not sure you should have done a, a t-test here. I think it really is an ANOVA situation, you know, like, or something like that. They're all mathematically equivalent, as, as we'll get into a little bit, of the same thing. It really, the, the label that we put on it really has to do with, you know, the nature or number of those response variables, and then the nature or number of the predictor variables. So the first the kind of the simplest member of the general linear model family is where you've got one quantitative response variable and you've got one qualitative or categorical predictor variable and that's a two sample t-test right you got two groups and you want to know if the quantitative variable is different between the two groups um, that can also be done it's mathematically equivalent can be done as a one-way ANOVA. It could even be done, and this is, you know, the beginning of blowing your mind, I guess. If you haven't thought about it this way, it can even be done as regression, simple regression. So if we look at that, and we talked about this already, so we don't have to spend any time on it. Um, in, the, in the GLM world, or in this uh, hypothesis testing world, and this kind of starts to get to why I'm, I'm trying to think beyond hypothesis tests, but we'll get to that in a few weeks. Let's just stick with this world right now. So we have this null hypothesis. We've got two populations and some quantitative variable we've measured. And our null hypothesis is that the population mean of, of group one is the same as the population mean of group two, right? That's what I mean by saying mu, remember mu, mu one, the, that's the population mean of, of the first group is equal to the population mean of the second group. And that's, uh, you know, if I want to translate that into a null hypothesis distribution, mu one minus mu two equals zero. And, you know, this is not sophisticated math that we're using this. So that's, what you're looking at, just like we talked about a, a week or two ago, when I sort of gave the basics of hypothesis testing, is that's a picture 
of the null hypothesis distribution, then all of the things I talked about when we were talking about, remember sampling the first year students, how old are you? And we take a sample of, I don't know, I think I said 150 students out of the uh, several thousand. So just like that, we sort of imagine, you know, if many, many times we took a sample from group one and a sample from group two and compared the means and doing that many, many, many times, we'd have a distribution of not sample means, but differences between sample means. And that corresponds, according to the central limit theorem, to a normal distribution. So all the same stuff we talked about with hypothesis testing goes here. And that's why you're seeing same kind of paradigm. We have these fences, I think of them as, as decision points. And if the value we get, we're only going to collect the data once. The whole thing about going out multiple times, that, that's just to establish sort of the theory behind the hypothesis test. But we go out and we collect a sample from each of the groups and we take the difference in the means. And if that difference in the means is not really, you know, it, it's very unexpected, relative to the null distribution, then we're going to reject the hypothesis. Same logic. So you start to see, and this is just a tiny window into what's, um, I don't know, frustrating or not frustrating, but constraining for me about hypothesis testing, is that really it boils down to, um, is, it, is the evidence point this way or that way? So, what we'll get into towards the end of the course is, well, which of these values are more or less likely for the difference between the means? So think about this decision um, paradigm that we're looking at is just, yeah, are we gonna reject or accept the null? Two, two choices. Um, and I'm not saying, oh yeah, for that reason, I want you to throw away all that hypothesis testing stuff and come with Bob on this adventure to this new way of saying, I mean, you have to understand this. So we're, I'm gonna do my best to help you understand it if you don't already over the next uh, couple of weeks. Okay, so um, we, as, as we did when, when we were first talking about hypothesis tests, we see where the test statistic, and in this case, it's just X bar one minus X bar two, you know, the difference between the two sample means, where is it on the null distribution? And the, the sort of the phrase that you say to yourself, and this is important, I'm totally anal about this because it gets screwed up so often. My daughter, who I think I mentioned, she just started a master's at uh, Queens in, in neuroscience. Whatever, wherever they got stats uh, advice from, they use this expression, you know, this thing about you test the null hypothesis and the p-value tells you the chance of getting the difference randomly or some some malarkey like that. Is this, is this just by chance, this difference? You know, that kind of absolute baloney. So the what this means, you know, when you get a p-value, it's what are the chances I would have got these data if the null is true? If the null is true, that's all the p-value is, right? So if the chance is pretty high, you know, the, the difference between the mean sample means is somewhere in here. Yeah, it's not, it's not a big shocker that I got that much difference between them if the null was true, if they were really exactly the same. But if it's out here, yeah, that, that's kind of a shocker. I don't really expect that very often if the null is true. So therefore I'm gonna reject the null. I don't think the null is true because I wouldn't expect this that often. So really firmly hang on to that as how you interpret a p-value. And of course, and you'll start to do hypothesis tests in lab two, make sure that you always, people sometimes, not this group, but sometimes they get confused between p and alpha, right? I did the test and alpha was 0 0.003. No, alpha is like, I've decided you know, you're, you're the scientist, you're the boss. You say, I'm gonna test these 
and alpha is going to be 0.05. And that, that honestly, that whole thing about alpha 0.05, because I think everybody remembers that, right? Yeah, yeah, alpha 0.05, or significant alpha 0.05. Um, that's really just a tradition, a lot of it from a combination of agricultural research and medical research, like pharmaceutical research. And remember what that meant. If alpha is 0.05, that means if the p value is less than 0.05, if I expect to get this value when the null is true less than that proportion of time, I'm going to reject the null. If it's greater than 0.05, I'm going to accept, or I'm not going to reject the null. But um, just, just remember the alpha value is like a decision. That's where I put these fences. And then the p value is where the value actually came when I collected the data, where it sits on that on that scale. Okay, see how fast we're moving. We we went. I think well, that circle looks a bit off, but I think we're going to go to. Yeah, well, well, we'll go to a regression version of t-test just before I slip into a note, and I'll do this really quickly. Um, it's it's really just showing you the kind of the unity of all linear models. So here's a regression, and it's a real regression. It's not it's not uh, you know the math is exactly the same. If you plug plug these data in, you know for the for the comparison I just made, I guess the the first comparison was between uh, two sexes in the the length. I think they were clams or something like that. So if you gave each of the males a sex code of zero and each of the females a sex code of one. So you got two values along the x-axis. But if you did a regression, you just put it into your regression uh, R script or whatever, then what it's showing you with that equation and the hypothesis you're testing is, is the slope something different from zero of that line. So the null hypothesis is that the slope is zero. What, what does the slope have to do with comparing two groups? Can anybody, anybody speculate? Because we've got these two stacks of data, right? So for the males, you've got this stack here, bunch of lengths. For the females, you've got a stack here. So what would it mean if that, if that, line that's the line of best fit there if it was horizontal which corresponds to a slope being equal to zero yeah lovely. yeah because the, in, when you've got a situation like this what defines the line is actually joining the the means of the two groups so if if the means are exactly the same the slope's going to be zero it's going to be horizontal if it's a little bit one way or the other, it's going to be a little bit different than zero. So you're really testing the hypothesis, just like that comparison of the two means. And you're saying, OK, if the null is true, if the slope really was zero, how often would I expect to get like a slope that steep? So it's the same hypothesis you're testing, same linear model. How well does knowing the sex of the clan enable me to predict the, the length of the shell? Um, things get mathematically slightly more complicated with a no, like one way ANOVA. I mean, one way ANOVA, which is that's when you have still categorical predictor, still one quantitative response variable, but you might have this, this situation here is exactly equivalent to the, you know, comparing the sex, um, comparing the clamshell lengths. Uh, one sex versus the other. But in the ANOVA sort of paradigm, which is, again, it's mathematically the same, you'll get the same p-value if you do a one-way ANOVA of, of the clam length data as you got for that t-test at the beginning, as you got for the regression that I showed you a minute ago. In the ANOVA context, though, what you're comparing, and that used to be apparently uh, it was... Um, really funny when I did this with intro stats like 20 years ago because it got uh, 
not mocked, what's it called? The impersonator at the Christmas party was, so you have the variation within and the variation among, and that's what you're comparing when you're doing a Nova, you know, a Nova design. So here it's sort of trying to show that with the, the yellow bars are showing you, I guess that's males on the left and they have their distribution with variability there. And you can see the, the width of their distribution, how variable they are with those yellow outward pointing arrows. Same thing with the females, uh, slightly bigger lengths. I don't know why the word frequency has the Y floating there, but anyway, we'll ignore that. Um, so you're comparing the amount of variability within those groups, sort of the average amount of variability within those groups to the variability between them with that big blue uh, double-headed arrow uh, above them. And if the variability within the groups is, uh, or sorry, uh, between the groups isn't really much more than you'd expect versus variability within the groups, then the ratio of one to the other. So you see the null hypothesis there, mean square A, that's like the variability between the groups relative to the mean square W, the variability within the groups, that ratio is going to be about one. That's what you would expect. You expect it to equal one if the null hypothesis is true, that the groups have the same mean. And so you're testing whether or not, how often would I expect to get this big a ratio of mean square among to mean square within if the null was true? Uh, same thing. That's why ANOVA is handy because if we have more than two groups, obviously doing just a t-test comparison of two groups is not on. So, but the same logic is going on. So here you see three groups. So you've got male, female, and hermaphroditic clams. And so three sexes. And in this case, still, you've got variability within each of the three groups. That's Those are the yellow two-headed arrows. And you've got variability between group one and two, two and three, and one and three. So you're sort of summarizing the variability among the groups with that MSA, summarizing the variability within the groups with that MSW, and testing the hypothesis that that ratio is less than or equal to one. So interestingly, you know, we'll get into um, the assumptions in general linear models uh, next week. And one of the assumptions that, again, probably rings a bell is homogeneity of variance. Anybody know what that means? Homogeneity of variance. Anybody online? Yeah, exactly. So one of the assumptions, and I, I purposely made the variance a little bit different with these three groups, is that you're, you're using one value for MSW, right? the variability within a group. So you're sort of mathematically basically averaging the amount of variability, the, the yellow double-sided bars here. So if that's strikingly different, that's going to break one of the assumptions of linear models, and that's going to cause you basically to have um, p-values that are not robust, that you can't really depend on them being uh, a good measure of whether or not your the evidence points to your null hypothesis being true. So, so we'll come up with, we have diagnostics to sort of look at that and, and judge our assumptions. And then we have strategies as to what to do when those assumptions uh, don't hold. This is, this is one of the biggies, but there's a couple of others that we'll talk about too. Okay, and this is, uh, you know, you'll, you've seen different versions of this and I'm just trying to illustrate with it with an ANOVA table, um, what you're doing, you know, when you calculate that F ratio and you're testing the null hypothesis um, that the, the variability among the groups is no greater than you would expect relative to the variation uh, within the groups. So in other words, you're testing the null hypothesis that the, the mean values are all equal. So the, I want to spend a little bit of time on multi-way ANOVA because, um, again, this is something everybody's probably got some familiarity with, but it's a very, it's an off, um, confused, um, 
aspect of general linear models, especially when we're thinking about potential interactions between predictors. So multi-way ANOVA is, I mean, comes in all sort of different forms, but um, basically you've got, still we're, we're sticking with the one quantitative response variable, and we've got more than one categorical predictor variable. And that's why, by the way, I, got, I forced everybody to make sure they had the response variable and they got more than one categorical predictor. So you could do multi-way multi uh, ANOVA with your, with your data to see how things came out. So um, let's look at it and back to, you know, I, I started my life working on uh, unionic uh, freshwater mussels. So let's look at a, an example of a, of a two-way ANOVA, just very simple, two-way ANOVA looking at two categorical predictors, um, uh, the stage, whether juvenile or adult, and the sex, whether male or female. And, and so what I'm going to show you, this is all pretend data. And I used to have, when I taught intro stats, I, I wouldn't give them an ANOVA table or data to do constructed two-way ANOVA. I would give them a picture like this and say, just by, by eye, tell me whether or not there's an interaction going on or a main effect of sex or, or stage. So what you're looking at right now, there's three hypotheses with two-way ANOVA. So this is a two-way ANOVA where we've got shell length as the response, stage and sex as the two categorical predictors. The very first hypothesis that you test is the interaction between the two categorical predictors. And this is, again, dead simple point, and, and uh, if it's old hat to you, just you know read a book or something while I say this, but so often confused, this interaction is in their effect on the response. It doesn't mean that they're correlated with one another. In other words, there's more juvenile males than there is juvenile females. So it's not talking about their correlation with each other. It's talking about their effects on the response variable. So in this case, with these data, let's just look at the data. And I always do that. So before you jump immediately to your ANOVA table or whatever, your multiple regression results, look at the data. And that's why I wouldn't let you do any tests the first week that you were looking at your data. So if we look at this, just by eye, we can see that juvenile clams are no different in shell length, whereas adult clams, males are... are bigger than females, longer than longer shells than females. So the way that I say that, if I'm talking about the, that, that means there's an interaction. The effect of sex depends on what life stage I look at. That's one way to say in words, an interaction. The effect of sex depends on which stage I look at. If I look at adults, yeah, males are bigger than females. If I look at juveniles, yeah. Males and females are the same. So the other way, and this is, again, slightly mind-blowing, I guess, is I could say it, the effect of age depends which sex I'm looking at. So if I look at males, yeah, males go from, I don't know, a couple of centimeters to 20 centimeters. Females, they go from a couple of centimeters to just 10 or 15. So... Either way, it's the effect of the one categorical variable depends on the level of the other that you're at. That's, that's characterization of an interaction. So what does it mean to not have an interaction? This is just showing you the ANOVA table corresponding with that. You're going to see that when you do a two-way ANOVA. You're doing the same thing. I mean, obviously, the math's getting more complicated, but you're judging those three hypotheses. And in each case, you're saying, is the variation, you know, for example, between the sexes averaged across the two life stages? Is it bigger than we'd expect given the variation within those groups and, and so on? That's what you're doing with those three hypothesis tests. Again, you're, you're slicing and dicing the data so that you can deconstruct those three hypotheses and separate them out. So here's an example, and this is why when Whenever I have a two-way data um, like this, like a two-way ANOVA situation, 
this is the kind of plot that I make because I look for parallel lines. Notice you might be thinking, oh, he shouldn't join those points because juvenile adult, that's not a numeric scale. But notice by looking at those lines that are joining the means of um, males on the top and, and uh, juvenile, or sorry, females on the bottom, um, that we can see they're parallel, which is another way of saying there's independent effects of both stage and sex. So just flip back to the, the first one. Notice the lines aren't parallel. So the effect of sex depends on which stage you look at, or equivalently, the effect of stage depends on which sex you look at. Did I just say the same thing twice? Anyway. But in this case, the two effects are independent of each other. Both sexes are growing a few centimeters from juvenile to adult stage, and males are a few centimeters bigger than females, both as juveniles and adults. So this is different data, and all I'm trying to show you is how, if all we have to go with is this graph that we're looking at, the plot that we're looking at, we can judge those three hypotheses one after the other. The other situations we can have are something like this, where there's in the independent effects, we've got um, the we've rejected the hypothesis that there's no stage effect. In all hypothesis, there's no stage effect. In other words, there's a slope to that line. The stages are different, but we've accepted the null hypothesis that there's no sex effect. So the two, the male and the female, are overlapping at each of the stages. And Finally, the other possibility is that we have um, no, we reject the, the null hypothesis of no sex effect, um, but we accept the null of no stage effect. And back to the interaction again. Okay, so is that cool with everybody? Anybody want to ask anything about that? Or is that great? Okay. So, I want to take some of what you just learned and maybe push it a little bit beyond what what you may have done before into the regression world. Um, there, at least when I deal with folks who who've learned uh, undergrad stats a lot, um, there's a great uh, I don't know discomfort around multiple regression, especially. And all, all sorts of stuff about, oh, correlated predictors and stuff like that. I just want to take that apart a bit and, and we'll kind of deconstruct that with uh, how you look at your data uh, in lab two. So what I'm going to use, that Western, uh, where I was a prof a few years ago, we unionized in the late 90s and um, related to that. And this is always the case. It's the case here at Ontario Tech. Don't know if it's happened at Laurentian before. And, and Laurentian's got a more complicated situation with respect to faculty salaries. But so what, what they did, there's perceived and, and real anomalies between different faculty, depending on, on gender and, and uh, discipline and all sorts of things. So um, UWO faculty, uh, the union was able to get this modeling done in, I think it was the early 2000s. Um, which uh, put together salary data with all sorts of other uh, descriptors of each faculty member. So, um, and this, the data that I'm going to show you is is uh, made up it's sort of semi-real data, just to just to sort of show you the the principle going on here. So, the predictive model, and th this is actually the real parameters that were estimated from this modeling. Um, but it was, remember, this is 20, about 20 years ago. So um, predicting salary from years since highest degree. And what that just means is I got my PhD in <laughs> 1987. So the years since my highest degree are 37. Wow. Um, so that's the predictor, that's the X value here. And it's just a simple regression. And, and that year since highest degree was a good predictor of salary at the time. 
And uh, you can see there that the intercept was 80K and then $800 added on the salary um, for every year since highest degree. And by the way, what they did, I mean, the model that they ended up using was more complicated than this is because every model like this is going to have, as you can see here, it's going to have a little bit of scatter around the, around the line. So they said, okay, here's Bailey's parameters. We'll plug them in. And Bailey's actually making um, 2000 a year less than, you know, what the model is saying. So we're going to give them a bump. And um, so, and I think I did make a few bucks in the, in the thing because I didn't really negotiate that well when I got my job at Western. I was like, yeah, thanks for the job. So multiple regression is really simple. It's a simple extension of that where you have, rather than a line of best fit, and this is where it gets slightly Star Trekian, we're, we're fitting a surface of best fit um, because we've got in the simplest possible extension of linear regression, we got two predictors. So years since highest degree and years at, at UWO, years at Western. And uh, you can see the effects. And again, those are real parameter estimates from that, that era anyway. And testing the null hypothesis that uh, the slopes, the individual slopes are zero. And, and you're basically fitting that, that I think is the real scatter of data there that I've gotten that that picture. I don't have the data set itself anymore, but um, so you, you're fitting, just like you fit a line of best fit, you're fitting, that's a table, you know, like, like it's a two-dimensional table. It doesn't bend at all. And it's saying, okay, certain value of years at Western, certain value of years since your highest degree, and together they predict a certain salary that, that you should have. So here's where it gets really interesting because, um, and here, I'm going to get you to do this. And this is not very often done in our real, our real research world, that just like in two-way ANOVA, remember I was talking about, so the effect of sex depends on which stage you look at. So you can, you can look at, look for interactions in a multiple regression context. And so in this case, I'm just, just showing you here that, um, We've got now three quantitative predictors of salary at Western in whatever it was, 2002. Um, years since highest degree, years at Western, and just one multiplied by the other. So that sounds totally freaky, but it's literally, this is not just a symbol. So when you look at your data and you do a multiple regression, I'm going to get you, I think I get you to check out and see if there's an interaction going on between your quantitative predictors. And what that's doing is fitting, and you can sort of see it in that in that uh, sort of cheesy uh, three-dimensional figure there, is it's kind of fitting the, this bending surface to the data and building that predictive model. So there's all sorts, and there's ways some of you would be familiar with or, or maybe have read in papers you've had to read where you can add, um, quadratic terms, you know, squared terms and cubic terms to uh, do the best job you can to build that, that predictive model and test it. Um, last one I want to mention, again, because it uh, comes up a lot, is uh, ANCOVA. And, and again, it, it, it's kind of like, oh, uh, I, th I think you should have done an ANCOVA here rather than a GLM or something like that. So it's just a situation where you, you might have a mixture of quantitative and categorical or qualitative predictors. And just going back to the, uh, the, the Western salary data. So imagine as, as happened, this isn't the exact data, but this is, was the nature of the data. So you've got a department that the faculty members working in. And we had an earth sciences department and we had biology department that I was in. And uh, so you've got department as a predictor and you've got years since highest degree as a predictor. And you can look at those just like in a two-way ANOVA. So here's uh, the, what the data is showing here is the two factors are independently affecting salary. So. Earth sciences people, doesn't matter how long since their years since highest degree, they're making more than somebody with the same years since highest degree in biology, which was true. And I was bitter. Um, and in this case, 
year since highest degree, same, same thing. They're independent of each other. Year since highest degree doesn't matter at all. It's just if you're in earth sciences, you're making more money than if you're in biology. And then this, this one where it doesn't matter which department you're in, this is definitely not the data. Um, it doesn't matter which department you're in, it just really matters what your year since highest degree is. So all I'm trying to illustrate is those same possibilities when you have a categorical and a quantitative um, predictor. And there's there's the interactions. So um, the only thing I wanna, wanna add before we talk about after the ANOVA, um, is, uh, no, I won't add that, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, okay. So when you you often see a two-way or, or more than two-way ANOVA, and you'll, in a, in a paper, and we might get this when people do their, you know, the, the review of papers at the end of the course, um, you know, Flabby gets up and said, yeah, um, Andrea found a significant interaction uh, between water depth and aspect of the shore in their effect on plant growth. And then she found that aspect from the shore was, you know, that was a significant predictor, but water depth wasn't. So the point I'm trying to make is the order that you test those hypotheses when you have more than one predictor is absolutely important. So you test the interaction first, because, and then if the interaction, if you reject the null hypothesis of the interaction, you, you can't go on because think about it. If the interaction is there, like getting back to my clam, well, let's, let's just look at the earth sciences biology comparison here. There's an interaction going on between department and years since highest degree. So I can't reject the, the null that there's no interaction and then say, yeah, and following that, the effect of earth sciences was significantly higher salary than biology. No, you can't say that because it depends, right? I can't generalize about the effect of department because I've just shown that whatever the effect is depends on years since highest degree. So you test that interaction first but don't let me catch you in your lab, rejecting the null for interaction, and then going on to talk about what are called main effects, the independent effects of your other predictors, because you've already concluded that you can't generalize. So those, those tests would be irrelevant. If you don't reject the interaction null, then yeah, for sure, go on and see if maybe you have this situation. There's no interaction, so uh, it turns out that department, yeah, I'm not going to reject that, but years since highest degree, I'm going to reject that. Okay. Okay. Uh, a little bit of controversial editorializing now. So um, it's almost universal now that, and I think, Mike, Mike, we may have chatted about this with your data. Um, so feel free to jump in. But um, You'll do an ANOVA or you'll do some kind of model. Um, yeah, usually it's an ANOVA context. You're comparing two or more groups with each other, maybe maybe in a, in a crossed multi-way fashion, maybe not. Um, you'll take the results to your supervisor and they'll say, um, okay, but to, do the uh, Tukey's least significant Bailian test to see which of these groups are really different. You know, you know, I, I get it that you got this significant difference, uh, the, this effect of, uh, of sex on the clamlet, but do the do the group by group comparisons to find out which of the groups are really different and which are are not different at all. And uh, again, a, a simple thing. That's where you get the asterisks or you get the letters. You know, different letters and over top of the groups that are are really different from each other according to some post hoc test. That's a quite a controversial actually kind of um, approach. And, uh, but again, very typical, you, you'll probably see it. Most of you will see it in, in uh, your research discipline. So I'm not, I'm not saying never do it again, because that will probably get you in trouble. All I'm saying is may, maybe think it through and just think about these two approaches and 
for those of you who want to know more about it, I've got I've got some guidance. But um, so in that kind of situation, there tends to be two two types of comparisons that folks make. One is much more common than than other. The first is our planned contrasts, they're called, which are fine. It's sort of like in your observational uh, data collection or your experiment, you plan to make these these uh, comparisons. And I'll give you a couple of examples, excuse me, of that. And the other much more common is our so-called unplanned multiple comparison procedures. Um, so contrast or preconceived comparisons based on the science and what they tend to use. Uh, think of that t-test where we're just comparing two means. So they might compare a control to three levels of a toxin, for example. So contrast like that comparisons that really make sense with the science that that you have. Um, so yeah, a few examples, mean of a control group versus mean of mean of the means of all treated groups uh, or mean of the means of groups in one area versus mean of the means of groups in another area. And you're basically taking all the degrees of freedom you have for comparing groups and you're pre-planning what you wanna compare. Um, as I said, much more common and most of us have experience with this, including me is, you know, inspired by the results of the experiment or just as your sort of standard operating practice you make all possible comparisons between groups that you have. And as I said, people want to know, are those means really different as opposed to these other means over here? And, and as you'll see, when we get in, we'll talk about power and, and that sort of thing in a couple of weeks. And that feeds into why I have great trepidation over using these approaches. What I tend to do, by the way, is if I get results like this or this, I will go on the basis of the ANOVA and then I, it actually makes more sense to go back to a, a pure ANOVA example. I'll go on the basis of the results of the three hypothesis tests from the ANOVA and then I'll talk about it. So I don't need the extra um, step of saying, well, you know, are the females significantly different from the males uh, as adults and not significantly as you, you know, so going beyond the, the actual ANOVA, I, I treat the ANOVA as my license to talk about the nature of what I'm seeing in the plot, including specific differences of means that are, are there or not there uh, in the plot. I don't, I don't use post hoc tests, but Again, happy to talk about tests for those of you who have to use them, and uh, especially in the context of power later on. <laughs>